I heard a true story about a young man who was Jewish and went to an elder in his synagogue, all excited. And he said, I finally know what God wants me to do with my life. And the elder said, really? He said, I had a dream last night that I was the rabbi of a synagogue with a thousand families. And the elder said, that's great. But next, wait for 10 families from this synagogue to come up to you and ask you to be our next rabbi. And then you'll really know what God wants for your life. Wouldn't it be amazing if that's how leaders were chosen? That people just saw their gifts and said, we see it in you. You are who we need. You are what we want. Come lead us. That actually does happen in a way at every ordination of a deacon or a priest. Maybe a lot of you have been to ordinations before. And if not, a lot of you will have the chance to because we have some important ordinations coming up of people that we know in the next couple of years. So a lot of us will be there to see this moment that happens at every ordination. The vocation director, according to the ritual, comes forward and announces the name of the person who is about to be ordained, who is sitting out in the assembly. And when that person hears his name, he stands up and says, present, and then comes into the sanctuary. And the bishop says, do you know him to be worthy? And the vocation director says, he's received the required training. He's earned the degrees that are necessary. And we have inquired among the people of God. And they have proclaimed to us that he indeed is worthy to be their priest. And the bishop then says, then we choose you, our brother, to be our priest. And everybody says, thanks be to God, and erupts into applause. It's a goosebump kind of moment. I'm excited for you to see that. But it's also a telling moment because applause tells you a lot. You know what it's like to hear sincere applause, and you know what it's like to hear fake applause. If the priest-to-be receives sincere applause, you have a real sense that he is going to do some amazing work in his life. And if instead the applause feels forced or on cue, there's a good chance that his ministry is not going to have the power behind it that it needs. It tells us that there is a difference between having authority on paper and having real authority, the power that goes behind the authority that's on paper. Because holding an office can give you the authority that comes with it, but it will be hollow if it doesn't have the real integrity and the power behind it. Like, think of a priest. When you become ordained, you then have the authority to stand at the altar and lead Mass, the authority to preach the gospel, the authority to give people advice about their life challenges. But if the priest's way of celebrating Mass doesn't convey faith, if the homilies are kind of shallow and fall flat, if the advice that the priest gives doesn't really seem to help anybody, then there may be authority on paper, but it's not going to have the power it was meant to have. It's not going to make a real difference in people's lives. And that's true in many other professions, too. We call judges judges your honor. And if we do not address a judge that way, they can pound the gavel and demand that we do. And we will. But they can't make us mean it. If we don't find them honorable, they can't force us to mean your honor when we say it. And that's exactly what we're hearing about in that first reading today. Saul had the authority as king of Israel. On paper, he was the king. But the people lost confidence in him. And so they wouldn't follow him. And they looked at David. And they did exactly what happens at the ordination. They said, we select you, David, our brother, to be our king. And you know, that happens all the time. Did you see the news last week from Bolivia? That the president was trying to go for a fourth term. 
And they had an election, and it said that he won by a narrow margin, but the people didn't believe the results. They said he wanted this too much. He fixed this election. And so the pressure they put on him forced him to resign. So then we're led to the gospel, and we see the same thing played out in a very different way. Jesus has no authority, none. And the authorities who have it are crucifying him. He's got no recourse at all. And they're mocking him and calling him a king. But just to be ironic, he had no authority of any kind. But because of who he was and the way he lived his life, he had that real authority, that power that caused people to listen to him. And here we are, 2,000 years later, living 8,000 miles from where he lived. And we call him our king and our Lord. And what about the people who had the authority on paper? Is any confirmation student going to choose Herod or Pilate as their name for confirmation? Not one of them. It's amazing how authority on paper can be so hollow when you take a step back and look at the difference that integrity makes. And we heard this all the time. Do you remember all the scriptures whenever Jesus would speak and the people would talk to each other in a whisper like, hey, this guy's got real authority. He doesn't talk like the priests and the scribes. This guy makes a real difference when he speaks. And that is the kind of power, the kind of authority that we're talking about today. A priest friend of mine told me a generous story. He's been a mentor of mine for a long time, and he told me that when he was a young priest, he was standing at the pulpit giving a very self-confident rant on marriage with his finger in the air. And after Mass, a parishioner told him about a conversation that had happened. An older man who had been married to his wife for many years leaned into his wife and in a whisper that wasn't a whisper said, I wish I knew as little about marriage as this priest does. Real authority comes from knowing the terrain, from walking the talk. And that's what we hear about with Jesus. So this week, we're being given the opportunity to ask ourselves a big question. Clearly, God should have the authority in our lives. Clearly, our maker, who causes the sun to rise and set, who chose us to come here at this time in history, who has got the number of our days already in mind and knows when we're going to go home, That is the one who should rule our lives. That's the one who has power over us. But we have to ask ourselves, do we really give that power to God? Or is there something else getting in the way? Because we all know people, and maybe it's us, who really bow down before money. Right? We all know people who hate their job with a passion, but they will never quit it because they love the salary. We all know people who bow down really more to their emotions. Do you know what we call that when someone bows down before whatever emotion they're feeling? We call them moody, and people do not like it. It makes it so hard to live when you're with somebody who bows down before whatever emotion they're feeling at the time. It's so hard to know how to approach them. Or how about people who bow down before whatever seems pleasurable in the moment? You know, when we bow down before, oh, that looks good. Let's try that. Oh, this this is what I want to do right now. So we all know people who are rich, but who have died miserable and lonely. We all know moody people who've lost important friendships because it wasn't worth it anymore. We all know pleasure seekers who aren't trustworthy. And we are being called to ask ourselves, how about me? What do I bow down before? Is Christ really the king? Do I really give him the authority? He's got the authority on paper, but do I give him the real power in my life that he deserves? Because if if a thief hanging on a cross next to him could recognize his real authority, how much more can we? 